Do you have a car in the D.C. metro area? I do, and sometimes it can be a real bummer. But that's why there's Car Care to Go. Car Care to Go is the future of car maintenance and repair, and it's now as easy as ordering groceries online. They'll pick up your vehicle from your home or office and bring it back when the work is done. You can get your first synthetic oil change for $20.23 with the code FIRST20. Book now at carcaretogo.com. Here's what DC is talking about. There's just no way around it. All of us are going to die. And in DC, a lot of folks are dying alone. Death doula Laura Listermensch is trying to change that by working as a death doula and encouraging death positivity in the district. It's Wednesday, March 1st. I'm Bridget Todd, and this is CityCast DC. I'm here with Laura Listermensch, and Laura, you are a death doula. For folks who have never heard that term before, it's a totally new term. What exactly is a death doula? Technically, an end-of-life doula or a death doula is someone who is uh, a non-medical supporter of the dying person. And so the role of a, of a death doula would be to help someone do a life review, think about what's, what their life has been, to be able to talk about death in a way that most people don't want to talk to their kids or anyone else. So to have someone who wants to listen to them to make plans for, you know, what their their values are for the end of life and what they want to happen after they die. And we just don't have that function in our society anymore. So it's a new, it's a new way to support dying people or just humans because we're all dying people. I think there's also a kind of a, a sense we have that if we don't talk about it, it won't happen. There's a denial. So... That part is the part that I'm most focused on, actually, is the denial, honestly. What does it look like to break through that denial that folks might have around their own death? Conversation. So easy. So simple. A lot of people die alone in D.C. So one of the things I do is I volunteer at a hospice to be with people who don't have family and friends with them. And, you know... I, I'm finding that what people will do is they'll kind of, if I tell them I'm doing this, they lean towards me. They put their hand on my hand for some reason, touch my hand, and they say, I want to tell you about something. And they'll say something, and then later they'll say, I never told anyone that. Now, I am not a psychologist. I am not a therapist. I'm not a you know, hospice chaplain. I, I'm none of those things. But I am another human being who has declared my intention to listen to people when they want to talk about death. Wow. You mentioned that in D.C., a lot of people are alone in their final hours. Do you think that's specific to D.C.? Like, what is going on that so many folks in D.C. are dying alone? Poverty, to be honest. So what happens is people end up in a hospital, in a hospice ward, um, because there wasn't someone at home with the time and the money and the wherewithal to take care of them 24 hours a day in their dying process. Um, But there are a lot of people who die alone at home, too. Hospice is not going to have staff there all day. And most of us non-medical professionals don't know how to support someone in death. And people avoid it. People avoid being around people. But for those who um, don't have a stable housing situation for those who don't have people who can take off their jobs. Uh, maybe they've alienated their families. Maybe their, their, their life is unstable. They might end up being alone in a hospice ward. Very well taken care of, by the way. I, I've, uh, there could not be any better medical and safe environment than the, the, the Sibley Hospice Ward uh, for Capital Caring that I volunteer at. I will probably try to die there personally because I just really think it's a it's a peaceful beautiful caring environment with great great staff but um, I don't want to be alone I don't want anyone to be alone for folks who might be interested in volunteering in this kind of work what sort of responsibilities do death doulas have so it's interesting um, I do not function as a death doula when I'm volunteering at hospice I'm a hospice volunteer like everybody else 
But if someone wants to volunteer for hospice in particular, that's a particular way to support dying people. There are others. But that particular way, um, mostly it's just companionship. You know, when I sign in, I'm saying companion. And mostly what I'm doing is I'm going into the rooms, I'm changing the water in their flowers. I'm talking about, you know, the weather. I'm opening shades. I'm sitting next to them. Uh, there might be, sometimes I hum, sometimes I read poetry. Um, I follow what the person needs. And often I hold hands. That is, that seems to be the thing that I'm most needed for. Do you think there's something about that that yearning for a little bit of physical intimacy of of holding hands that people in their in their last moments are looking for? Why do you think that's something that you that you find yourself doing in this work so often? This is something that I I don't know if I could describe adequately, but there seems to be something essentially human about this. And I've thought a lot about this, you know, for example, it's almost like an orphanage. If you went to an orphanage to volunteer, you would hold the babies and you would love them. You just love them. And you just lean in to giving them the touch and the support that they need. And I kind of feel like that's something I can offer. I'm not everybody can, can feel comfortable. Um, but in time, I, I learned to be able to, to find peace and be a peaceful person in the room. And that's a lot of what a death doula is doing. And then there's another side to death doula, which is being someone who knows something about the, the things you need to do at the end of life, the plans you need to make, the paperwork you need to do, the collecting of your, of your items, the cleaning up of your digital life. But most people are so avoiding the topic of death that they don't do any of that. Just as an example, I have two dads. One of my dads died a couple of years ago, and I thought he would have left me a letter. He did not leave me a letter. I was like looking in the mail, like, I'm sure somebody arranged that he would send a letter. Uh, and then, you know, I thought about it, have I written my letters? And so I do. <laughs> There's a letter for everybody out there. I'm a writer, so I believe we should write down our values and, and, and our feelings about it about the people we love and, and who we care about. That's such good advice. And if you're someone who doesn't want to think about death, is, is thinking like, if I, if I don't think about it, it won't happen, you won't be able to be in a position to give your loved ones that because you're not even thinking about it happening to you. So one of the sessions that we had for Death Doula Days, which we do every Saturday, was to write our own obituaries. And it was really interesting to see largely young people at this session who were struggling with these questions and they were doing the work. They were the papers covered with writing. And afterwards I heard from several and I've heard, you know, since then as well, that they felt like this this was their opportunity to change what their future obituary would be by making sure that they were doing the things and being the person that they want to be in their obituary. FrameBridge, the custom framing company, is the perfect way to refresh your space for the new year by framing everything, everything that matters to you. That's because they can FrameBridge just about anything. Game day jerseys, selfies, your anniversary dinner menu, artwork, your favorite movie poster, a love letter from the people at CityCast DC, anything. Here's how it works. You go to FrameBridge.com and upload a digital photo. If you have a physical piece to frame, like a poster, they will send you complimentary packaging to safely mail it into their owned and operated studio where the framing will begin. You preview the piece online in dozens of frame styles. You choose your favorites. The experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your piece and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. And instead of paying hundreds, their prices start at 39 bucks. You can order online at FrameBridge.com or you can shop at a FrameBridge store near you, which if you live in D.C. means a whole bunch of stores. Get started today. Frame your photos or give someone the perfect gift. Go to FrameBridge.com and place your order now. So let's talk about some of the programming that you offer that folks could check out. I'm familiar with your death cafes, but talk to me about some of the programming you offer. So uh, there's going to be a variety of things this year. Congressional Cemetery is an active burial ground and uh, also a dog park and an apiary and a conservation space. It's a lot of things. But what they've added this year, uh, which is really special, is more death positive 
programming. And if my mother hears me say death positive, she gets really irritated. She says, no, I'm not death positive. No, it's death positive, Laura. But what we're trying to say with that is like the same thing as with sex positive. We're, we're going to accept that it's a normal part of life and we're going to, um, we're not going to shame people for talking about it. We're not going to avoid thinking that it actually happens and make it a secretive thing. It's in the open. We talk about death. We're death positive. And um, Congressional Cemetery is kind of making a space for that. So we've got these Saturday programs. Every Saturday, we're doing some sort of activity. It's not just conversation. It's doing things. Like we're going to have a day when we uh, clean up our digital lives. Uh, we're going to have, you know, a mortician come. We're having a chaplain come. We're having uh, widows come. People who know something about these topics and have talked a lot about them to be part of our conversation around the table. No lectures, no speeches. We're going to screen some documentaries and talk about them with the filmmakers. We're going to do art. We're just going to lean into the whole topic is what we're doing. And it's still open. We could do anything. I'm inviting the public to tell us what they want to do. And then I'm doing all the things that I like to do. <laughs> and just uh, making, a, making a space for all this this year. What's your hope with all this programming? Like, what do you hope to accomplish? My goal when I think about it is not just because I, I want to do the thing that I enjoy and meet these kind of people, but also, what if, uh, crazy idea, we could in D.C., um, have hundreds and hundreds of people who feel more comfortable talking about death with their friends and family, uh, do more work to uh, take care of their advanced care arrangements. They uh, figure out who's going to be their health care agent. They write their wills. They uh, write down their ethical will. And there's so many that we could do. If a lot of people here in D.C., we we just raise our awareness and that raised the level of peace and happiness that people had about this inevitable thing that we share. I just, that's my dream. How did you get into this work? Take me through your journey of becoming a death doula. I've always been that girl um, to some degree. Uh, I've always been comfortable with birth and death in a way that most of my friends would run away from. And so... And I'm also of a certain age. I'm 61. So I've seen a bunch of births and I've seen a bunch of deaths. And they get closer and closer every year. So when, you, when you're around it a lot and you realize that people, other people are avoidant and uh, shaming around it, that always interests me. And so I really felt like, well, I, in this stage of my life, um, I want to lean towards this and be a resource and a positive part of this inevitable part of our shared existence. And um, like I said, also I'm getting older and there is no way to not think about that I don't have as much time ahead of me as I have in the past and what what's important to me. And so I'm going on with this process with everyone else. I'm not an expert. But I am someone who really likes to pull people together and have difficult conversations. I always have. That's just important to me. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions about death doulas and death positivity and sort of death in general? I have to imagine that you probably encounter some level of public confusion about these topics. So I made either the mistake or the great move of reading the comments on the Washington Post article about this project. And I loved it. Uh, it, it. I did get to see a lot of what the public thinks about this. Mostly it's eye rolling. But the misconceptions are largely around things like uh, that this is a kind of a woo-woo uh, shallow, privileged concept. And I am very much about this being a death equity situation. You know, if, if it's only rich women, rich white women, who are doing this work and who are getting this service of having 
you know, an end of life doula in their lives, then we have failed. And I, I think that when we think of death in DC, for example, there's some really serious questions about about health equity and and access and poverty that you know involves death, but we don't want to talk about it. So I think we we need to be doing that. My concerns about the misconceptions have to do with people think, well, my loved one is in hospice, it's fine. But hospice isn't enough to give someone the full circle of support that they need. And, you know, sometimes that's family, but family needs to understand what it means and and be able to support somebody, not just leave it to the medical care and not be home alone with their dying loved one and not understand what's going on. So the misconception that, one, death is inevitable. No, it is. It is. <laughs> It is, it is going to happen to all of us, uh, that there's nothing we can do to help people. Uh, we definitely could be doing better. And that it's not a social equity issue would be the biggest misconception. We do not have equal access to, to end-of-life care or uh, what happens to our bodies afterwards. Absolutely. What would you say a healthy relationship or outlook on death looks like? I would say it is not without fear because fear is normal, I think. But a healthy attitude would be uh, understanding that our time is finite and using our time in ways that that fit our values, which is unique for everybody. Nobody's the same. But we all have values and we all have relationships. And if we can be there for each other when the inevitable happens and find uh, find ways to support people when they're ill and when they're dying, and to bring a calm, loving presence to something, even if it's scary. It's, it's scary to see somebody be very ill, but we can still bring our calm and our love and not just fight death as if it's the problem. Laura, your passion for the work is palpable. Thank you so much for being here and the work that you're doing, because it's you've made it very clear it's very necessary and very needed. Thank you. And before you go, some quick news. D.C. Council member Kenyon McDuffie is reintroducing a bill calling for reparations for D.C.'s Black residents. McDuffie originally proposed the legislation in October 2020, but it died in session before making it to a vote. He says the law aims to right stark racial inequalities in the district that he blames on intentional laws. Meanwhile, Montgomery County Public Schools will implement new safety policies in school restrooms in an attempt to prevent opioid overdoses. School staff will do visual checks inside restrooms throughout the school day, and in high schools, the outermost bathroom doors will be modified so that students cannot close them. Five students died from opioid overdoses in January. And lastly, the Dave Thomas Circle Wendy's, also known as the most hated Wendy's in America, will soon be demolished. An application to raise the fast food joint was filed with the city yesterday. D.C. is planning a major overhaul of the chaotic intersection, including bike lanes and three new public spaces. And as always, we'll end with our D.C. life hack of the day. There are lots of famous graves that you can visit in the Congressional Cemetery, but one might surprise you. The composer John Philip Sosa. He spent years in the Marine Corps band as a musician and later a conductor, but he's actually buried here for a different reason. He was a native Washingtonian. The cemetery honors Sosa every year with a graveside concert on his birthday. Do you know any fun tips or facts that we should share for our daily D.C. life hack? Email us. We're at dc at citycast.fm. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. And if you've enjoyed the show, why not share it with your friend who can't stop thinking about their own mortality? We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then. 